go. This is Thursday, December 14, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today George Davis Snow. Welcome, George. Hi there. Hi there. May I ask when you were born? I was born May 5th, 1930. And where were you born? In Framingham, Massachusetts. And where do you currently live now? I live in Holliston. Your marital status? I'm married. Do you have children? I have five children, three boys, two girls. Any great, uh, any grandchildren? I have uh, four grandchildren mm -hmm. and uh, one great-grandchild. Congratulations. Tell us what uh, Framingham was like growing up. It was much smaller than it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, my hemisphere was uh, very narrow because I left there when I was six years old. But what I do remember was uh, where the Odessa plant is now, mm -hmm. formerly the Buick Oldsmobile Pontiac. That used to be Teddy Gould's airport. He had uh, a few milking cattle there, and I earned my first money riding up and down the center of that field, which was used as a runway uh, on my bicycle. I'd get a nickel each trip to sh shoo the cattle off the <laughs> runway so the plane could either come in or take off, yeah, which was a fun thing. And uh, my other project was with Hogman Rubber Company, for those who can remember, uh, selling Xarex to the, the workers during the noon hour when I'd come home from school for lunch. But uh, as far as Framingham goes, the, the, my main thing there was uh, it was always a treat to go down to my grandfather's carriage shop. And he had the first uh, automobile dealership in town, the old Peerless. And uh, used to hang around there. That was, mm -hmm. that was a marvel for me at six years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you told me before the interview, you, uh, your family actually lived close to what is now MCI Framingham. Yes. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Well, our little house on Aaron Street, the backyard, abutted the, uh, the field that the uh, Sherman prison used to uh, raise their crops. They'd be out there early in the spring to get the fresh dandelions for salads, and then they would plant vegetables and corn uh, and care for that through the year. They were pretty self-sufficient. Uh, never thought anything about them being prisoners, uh, they were friendly people. And for a little kid, boy, didn't, uh, how would I say, didn't know any different as far as who they were or what they were doing. I remember one, one year, I believe it was 1934, <laughs> they had a tremendous snowstorm and it, heavy snow, and I was able to uh, climb up onto the, the roof of the house. There was a snow drift that went over the fence and out into that field, and to me at that time seemed like forever uh, to slide out and over that fence and out into the field on my little sled. <laughs> but uh, moved from there up to uh, Northbridge, take care of my grandfather, who had just lost his wife. And then uh, during the early part of the war when they had gas rationing, mm -hmm. uh, my dad found this house in Holliston, moved there. Mm -hmm. And probably the biggest surprise of my life was when I attended my first day of school in Holliston to find that the principal of the school and also the seventh and eighth grade teacher was my aunt. 
And uh, I figured, oh boy, <laughs> she can be a toughie. But I made friends almost overnight with the, the whole class because they figured, oh gee, his aunt is the teacher, we'll sidle up to him and we'll get treated nice. <laughs> And everything went fine until the first day I forgot my homework and she lifted me right up by the shirt up against the wall and said, you'll never forget your homework again. And she did that purposely to let everyone know that there was no favoritism. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a, a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. um, we. Uh, we had fun in school, mm -hmm. uh, got lots of exercise. We'd get out and uh, play dodgeball and uh, mm -hmm. racing and scavenger hunts and all mm -hmm. sorts of things, but we're out in the fresh air, which is something I think a lot of the kids today never have the chance to experience. Mm -hmm. You're too busy with the iPods. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about um, Holliston during the war years. Do you remember uh, when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Yes. I've, I was still in school, and that probably was one of the biggest things to determine where I was headed in life. I was much too young to uh, to go into the service, but we followed it very closely and uh, in the school system they explained almost day to day just what was going on, why it was going on. Uh, I've got pictures at home of uh, the Army bringing uh, a couple of Jeeps up to the school. I think I was in eighth grade at the time. Uh, on a uh, savings bond or war bond tour and we'd bring in our nickels and dimes every week to buy mm -hmm. the uh, stamps. But uh, I joined what they call V6 which was a voluntary commitment to the Navy when I was uh, a senior in high school. And uh, by joining V6 and taking the examination, it was determined that I would do well in the field of electronics. And that's what I pursued. Uh, I joined the Navy Ten days after I graduated from high school in June 1948, and uh, went out to Great Lakes, Illinois. It was uh, Company 221 in uh, June of 1948, mm -hmm. and uh, everything went well. We had an opportunity to really meet people from other parts of the country. Being a country boy from Holliston, I, you know, didn't know how other people mm -hmm. looked at life. But uh, <laughs> talk about amusing experiences. Uh, I was probably gullible enough, like a lot of young people, still wet behind the ears. I got sent off one day by the commander of our group to bring him back 25 feet of shoreline. Well, they sent me to building after building, each one that I'd go to, uh, <laughs> they'd send me to a different building. And finally, after about an hour and a half, one of them suggested I go down to uh, the shoreline, and it hit me. I'd been had. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 
after I completed uh, boot camp, I came back home, and that was an experience. Uh, apparently, I'd picked up uh, a, a germ along the way. I ended up with pneumonia from a, my short stay at home, and then uh, ended up at the uh, the hospital, Chelsea, Chelsea Naval Hospital. They let me have four days to visit at home and then shipped me back to start school. Happened to be a snowstorm at the time and uh, the train got stuck somewhere out of, around Buffalo and we sat snowbound for 24 hours. <laughs> And uh, it was the old steam engines, mm -hmm. and uh, had a great time uh, sharing what little food we had brought with us. But I went on to uh, electronic school. At that time, it was a 48-week school where they crammed, essentially, four years of electronic engineering mm -hmm. into that school. Okay, and where was this? This was at Great Lakes. Back at Great Lakes, okay. I was doing fairly well in the uh, the hands-on nuts and bolts part of electronics, but uh, I think it was the eighth week they hit us with calculus, and I wasn't the heaviest in math because back in the high school my last two years uh, was a busy time for Holliston. The uh, superintendent was also the pr principal mm -hmm. and the physics teacher and the chemistry teacher. So I did well in uh, chemistry and physics, so he had me teaching some of the freshmen and sophomores and as a result, I missed a lot of math classes, which I probably should have had. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I got into the calculus bit, and uh, I failed. They started me back two weeks prior, mm -hmm. go over it again. Had guys try to help me along with it, but I just couldn't seem to get it. Mm -hmm. So they shipped me out to sea. My first ship was uh, the USS Goodrich. It was a radar picket destroyer. And uh, I arrived on board just in time to uh, go on a six month uh, tour of the Mediterranean. And that was a wonderful experience. Uh, just prior to that, I had gotten my Navy driver's license. Mm -hmm. and there weren't very many people on the ship that had a military uh, driver's license. So I ended up on shore patrol. And uh, being a radar picket, we went into uh, small ports because we operated independently ahead of the fleet. So we would uh, get into little towns like Mentone, France, and uh, one of the officers, either a lieutenant or an ensign, and I would go out and tour the area and look for the hot spots that uh, bared watching as far as the uh, personnel from the ship coming ashore. So we were able to see a lot of the, the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had my, can, my uh, camera with me and got a lot of great shots. My real interest was uh, with the real people. In a, in a city uh, close to a seaport, you, you've got a, a different type of people. They're, 
They could all speak English regardless of what country you go into. Those looking for the tourist and for the military and, uh, you know, grab you with a lure you into uh, expensive bars mm -hmm. and so forth. But <coughs> there were three of us in the uh, electronics department that uh, we'd get liberty together and go out, go out into the countryside, maybe rent a bicycle or something mm -hmm. and, and go out into the countryside and see the real people. And I found that regardless of where you went in the world, the people are all essentially the same, all hoping and dreaming to have their kiddos grow up a little better off than they were. Mm -hmm. Uh, and really, you know, governments are one thing, they, they have their own agenda, but, but people, people are real with the same dreams, regardless of where you go. Mm -hmm. So um, you're actually now six month appointment in the Mediterranean, and this is just after World War II, but yes. the beginning of the Cold War. Tell yeah. us what that was like. <coughs> At that time, 1949, mm -hmm. uh, the Navy operating in the Mediterranean uh, got the uh, Navy Occupation Medal, and that's how we, I could join the VFW. Uh, because we were still uh, working with the country of Albania, which was uh, still occupied. But I saw no, no conflict at all. We were essentially the, the peacekeepers and uh, showing the world that we had muscles of flex if necessary. Mm -hmm. When you were going on on shore leave, did you see um, any parts that were damaged by the war? Oh yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of places, particularly the poorer cities, uh, they didn't have the funding or the wherewithal to uh, rebuild right away. And we saw a lot of what had been beautiful buildings uh, that were in, you know, total disrepair. Uh, it was one uh, church in particular that uh, had been destroyed. It was actually half of the church was there and the other half laid in a great rubble pile. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that struck me was in Mentone, France. Uh, there was a uh, a railroad's uh, what do they call a side side rail, mm -hmm. where there were probably twenty flat cars with <coughs> excuse me Massey Harris tractors on them, still crated, had never been opened, been sitting there for probably a year when we got there. I was asking one of the townspeople there, well, what's with all of the American-made tractors? He said, oh, they were sent there under the Marshall Plan. Well, why are they still in the crates? Well, you're sending us all the food we can eat. So <laughs> that <laughs> was my first real I open her as to how how much waste there is in <laughs> <laughs> planning. So anyway, uh, after six months in uh, the uh, Mediterranean area, I got called into the captain's office, and he said, "Well." 
he said, got a lot of good reports on you. He says, uh, how would you like to go back to school? I said, sure, that's great. But I think we still had another month or two to, to go before we got back to the States. So I'm looking ahead. And uh, he says, well, we were in uh, Tunisia at the time. He says, well, pack your bags, you'll leave <laughs> tomorrow morning. And uh, so there I was at the airport, back out to Great Lakes. This time I'm uh, third class electronics tech. And uh, as a petty officer going through school, you had certain privileges, but also certain additional responsibilities. But I was able to fly through with flying colors because I'd uh, not only put a lot of experience under my belt working with equipment, but I'd also done away with calculus. <laughs> so I didn't have to bother with that anymore. No more calculus. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to uh, the Goodrich after I graduated from school. Uh, second class at that point, and uh, the time was just about up on my first enlistment, and uh, I got a, a call from the skipper again. He says, uh, they need your experience back at First Naval District in Boston. Well, I figured, Boy, what a gift. <laughs> Just down the street from home, I could take that. I worked with the uh, First Naval District Office of Naval Intelligence and the training center there for six years. And uh, made chief, eventually. But I worked primarily with the uh, reservists, uh, giving them electronic training, working with uh, ONI, repairing their surveillance equipment and so forth. And when my time was up at uh, First Naval District, the Admiral of the district uh, said, okay, what would you like? Well, I had always admired the submarine service because wherever we went, uh, submariners, right from the, the captain down to the mess cook, would go on uh, liberty together. Mm -hmm. They were a very close-knit group. The camaraderie was very obvious. I said, I'd like to go to submarine school. The Admiral hopped a plane, went down to the bureau in Washington, and got me a set of orders cut to submarine school. I was too old and overrated, but they, they took me anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, So what year was this now? This was in uh, 1960, 1960. Wow. So we just <coughs> skipped over career and everything. Uh, I got down to sub school, <coughs> excuse me, and being a chief, uh, they expected an awful lot from me. I'm competing with young, bright young fellows. Uh, so I had to work extra hard to uh, make it through the school. And where was the school? This was uh, the submarine school at New London, Connecticut. New London, okay. That's where they had the, uh, the diving tank where you go up and free ascent from uh, 100 feet and uh, passed all that stuff. And then we had our day at sea. 
So our whole class went aboard a submarine, sailed down the Thames River and got out into the operating area. And being a chief, the commanding officer looked at me and says, okay, chief, take her down. Well, I think that's the closest point in my life that I ever felt like I might soil my trousers. <laughs> <laughs> because the responsibility of that, I, all this stuff was running through my head. All we'd ever done is on paper and talked about it in the classroom. Oh dear, calculus all over <laughs> again. And I'm thinking, boy, I could sink this thing if I do it wrong. <laughs> Of course, no one would have let me do that, mm -hmm. <laughs> but fortunately, I made it. <laughs> and uh, what uh, finished sub school, and I figured, well, New London's only an hour and a half from home. I can finish out my 20 years uh, on some diesel boat operating out of New London. Mm -hmm. But that isn't what they had in mind. They uh, put me in a pre-commissioning crew for the uh, USS Daniel Webster. It was a fleet ballistic missile submarine. And uh, I was the senior uh, chief as far as the inertial navigation department. So off I went to Damneck, Virginia to study uh, inertial navigation, and then back to uh, a school in Pennsylvania on a Type 11 scope, and grooming out the equipment. We finally took it to sea in 1962, and uh, had our sea trials, fired our first missile, and uh, war training, finally went on our first patrol. And the uh, navigation officer, because I was the assistant navigating officer, he was uh, a very nervous individual in his, his first uh, patrol on a, a missile sub. And the, the pressure was unbelievable. Uh, he, he was unsure of himself and wouldn't, you know, we, we knew what we were doing and what we had to do. <coughs> but uh, anyway, I, I had a heart attack. And uh, so I got transferred at the end of the <coughs> patrol to uh, a tender so that I could stay in the service and uh, finish out my time and they could use my experience uh, on board a submarine with uh, running a uh, repair facility on the tender. I was on the USS Holland AS-32, uh, operating on a road to Spain, where at that time the uh, submarines would come in for their uh, upkeep. Because the way it worked it, on fleet ballistic missile subs, you'd go out for three months and go back in to be serviced, and the, the crew would change over and. They had a blue crew, gold crew operation. So I was able to uh, go aboard a lot of different submarines. I was the inspector to make sure that their equipment was ready for sea. Mm -hmm. And finally, after all of that, uh, <coughs> retired in uh, 1968. The for 21 years, of, because they counted that year of V6 as mm -hmm. uh, time in service. 
But I enjoyed it tremendously, and I'd be there today if it wasn't for family. Uh, my retirement experience was great because primarily we're never sitting still in an area long enough to bring my family. But the last year of it, uh, down in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, I was able to bring my family down because at that time they moved uh, the tender to Charleston. Mm -hmm. And they lived, we lived in a place called Men River Park in name of Mendel Rivers, who was very Navy conscious senator. Mm -hmm. And uh, enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, when it came time for my uh, departure from the Navy, they sent a ship, a, a, a small, well, the captain's gig up the river, the Cooper River, to pick up my family at Men River Park, brought them down, and they had the uh, retirement ceremony on the stern of the USS Holland. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was quite a nice experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the kids, well, quite young, but still remember it. Right. And, uh, You're wearing the cap of the USS Canopus, or is, is yes, that I, the correct pronunciation? Canopus. Canopus, okay. Uh, it's named after a star. Mm -hmm. uh, after I left the uh, uh, Daniel Webster, mm -hmm. had had my heart attack, I went to the Holland and then got transferred to new construction mm -hmm. down in Pascagoula, Mississippi, where the Canopus was built and groomed it out and brought it back over to Rota, Spain. I didn't have enough time left in service to stay with it, so I came back on the Holland mm -hmm. to uh, Charleston and retired from there. Okay. And what happened after you retired? Well, uh, I had been in the American Legion for quite some time <coughs> in service. I joined the VFW. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been quite active in both. I've uh, past commander of the VFW uh, 12 years as commander mm -hmm. and presently the chaplain. This is the VFW in? In Holliston. Holliston, okay. <clears throat> Matter of fact, we just sold our building uh, because the, the young people that are coming back, they're too busy with raising a family and so forth to, to really get involved in a military mm -hmm. organization. So we've lost our membership seat at uh, decline from over 130 some odd down to around 60. Mm -hmm. And a good share of those are living outside of the state now. So with the cost of uh, try to keep an old building up mm -hmm. by today's standards. We just couldn't handle it anymore, so. Mm -hmm. The new owner has allowed us to continue retain our identity by giving us space to use in the downstairs area so we still have our meetings and so forth. Mm -hmm. The Legion meets with us as well. so. One thing that I'm proud of as, as commander of the uh, VFW, several years ago we had the moving wall brought out to Holliston. And uh, being a small town, mm -hmm. it was uh, a big fight to, to get it there. 
But we had three men on that wall, and uh, it was our 275th anniversary mm -hmm. for the town of Holliston, and that was our gift to the town, was to bring it out. And that was very moving experience. I was there probably the whole, yeah. the whole time it was <laughs> in town for the 10 days, uh, and saw some remarkable closure of people that had visited the wall. Mm -hmm. I remember one young woman in particular, she had been given a bracelet to wear, which she wore res religiously uh, all these years at the Vietnam. And uh, she was hesitant, but finally came to the wall and, and found the name that she had been wearing. She never knew the person yeah. and uh, left the bracelet. And there were so many things left. It was interesting in talking with the, the man that uh, brought the equipment, brought the wall to the mm -hmm. town, that every item that's left is cataloged mm -hmm. and brought back to California mm -hmm. and uh, kept at the museum there. Yeah. Now, that's because so we had the moving wall in Natick in 2011. So yes. We, we, had, we share the same experiences, so to speak, but it is an incredible experience. Yes, it yes. is. Even more so than the, the wall in Washington, mm -hmm. because being in a small area without the hubbub, the quietness. I can remember one night, uh, it was about two o'clock in the morning, and we heard six motorcycles come in, and oh gee probably guys that have had a little bit too much. <coughs> and these big burly fellows with their leather jackets mm -hmm. came in and not a peep. They quietly walked to a specific panel on that wall and they sat down in front of it. They were there about an hour. And they came back out and uh, th every one of them, you could see that they had been crying. Mm -hmm. So I went to that wall and to that panel, and the way the, the panels are done is not alphabetically, but by the date of death. And there were four all at the same time, it was their platoon. And, wow. Uh, you know, it, it's moving, moving things like that, mm -hmm. that that make you really appreciate your fellow man. Mm -hmm. George, your entire naval experience spanned from the end of World War II to almost the height of Vietnam. Uh, any comments on that? I mean, it was just a lot of, um, Changes. I mean, you were in, in electronics, and you were in the submarine service right at the start of the nuclear age. Um, what did you have to uh, say about that? One thing that still holds me in awe mm -hmm. is aboard one fleet ballistic missile submarine, you've got 16 missiles. Mm -hmm. Each one of those 16 missiles has multiple warheads. Each one of those multiple warheads has a target. So there is enough destructive power on one fleet ballistic missile submarine. It has more destructive power than all of the weaponry fired during the entire World War II by all forces. It, it gives you some idea of where we've come as far as the ability to destroy. Mm. And thank heaven that uh, 
No one has uh, unleashed such a weapon. And we thought that, uh, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, were horrendous. But these weapons today are a thousand times mm -hmm. more deadly. When you were in the submarine service, aside from uh, the heart attack on the Daniel Webster, did you or any of the crew uh, felt that close to having someone push the button against Russians? <coughs> During the uh, patrol, they would have exercises where the uh, red phone, so to speak, uh, you didn't know whether it was for real or whether it was practice. Uh, one thing about at that particular time, there was absolutely no communication because the whole idea of a fleet ballistic missile submarine was to stay undetected. And that was its only purpose, was to be a launching platform somewhere in the world. The uh, Russians at that time, and this is Cold War, uh, they had their submarines out there as well. And it was a cat and mouse thing. Uh, we would track them, leaving their seaports, they would track us. And As far as uh, these drills, we would get right up to the point, and it was a, quite a long procedure, involved an awful lot of people to make it happen, but it would be right up to the point of maybe the last three keys uh, being inserted before they'd say, all right, this is a drill. But you never knew. Mm -hmm. uh, you never knew whether the Red Sox won or lost. You never knew whether your dad, who wasn't feeling well when you left, passed away. There was no contact whatsoever. And uh, then they started with uh, family grams so that the family was allowed one upbeat, very short mm -hmm. note uh, each patrol, and then they upped it to two. I don't know what the situation is out there today, uh, but the uh, I'm sure that the way it works is that uh, they still retain their uh, secrecy as far as where they're at, how long they're there, Now, George, after you left the Navy, and as your children were growing up, did you ever discuss your naval service with them? Uh, not, not too much. Mm -hmm. uh, I did take a lot of pictures when I was on uh, the, the, the destroyer and down at the various schools I went to, and I had them on slides, and we'd show the slides. But mostly uh, the pictures were of regular folk mm -hmm. over in um, Portugal, for instance. I, <laughs> I was in civilian clothes and hitchhiked down the Costa del Sol to a fishing village. I wanted to get some pictures of, you know, the, the real people. <laughs> and. Uh, so I went by myself, and hitchhiking in Portugal, uh, one of the rides was on a, the back of a little wagon pulled by a donkey, <laughs> and then another one was on the back seat of a little motorcycle thing, and uh, I did get down to the village and took some marvelous pictures of uh, people that uh, 
whole families that worked together mm -hmm. to bring in the fish and uh, got invited to lunch with uh, a family that shared what they had. And I figured, well, time to get back because our ship was in Lisbon. So I started hitchhiking back and this black limo stopped. Chauffeur got out, opened the door and I got in. I can't speak Portuguese. And the man in the back could not speak English. And uh, he was in a fancy suit. And I'm thinking, oh boy, what have I got myself into? And he saw my camera and he picked it up and looked at it. And, you know, you can do a lot of talking with just body language. He picks up his little horn to speak to the driver and we swing off the road and I said, oh gee, I've got a problem here. And uh, we went up this uh, real steep hill, round of the corner, and there was a castle. Just about the time the sun's coming down, he handed me my camera. So I, I, I knew what he wanted me to do. He went out of his way to, so I could get a picture of this castle mm -hmm. in the sunset. Mm. And I, I, I did, I took mm -hmm. several pictures. I back in, continued on to Lisbon, the driver stopped and the man got out, went into the building and said something to the chauffeur. And instead of the chauffeur bringing me to the pier, he brought me to a restaurant. Talked with the maitre d'. I got ushered in, sat down. I was hungry anyway, but I, I still had trouble figuring, you know, how many dollars to the escudo, or which was the, the coinage there. Anyway, <laughs> I got served the most marvelous meal, and with every entree, it was a different wine, and uh, then dessert, and, you know, I, I'd no sooner uh, finish the fresh peas, then there was a waiter right there with more. <laughs> but anyway, I'm trying to figure out, gosh, you know, I think I'm at my limit. I've only got just so much money. <laughs> I can't go anymore. So I tried to ask for the bill. Maitre d' come over, no. So I left a tip, which <laughs> apparently was quite generous because the cook came out, the waiter came over, the maitre d' came over, <laughs> thanked me. And the chauffeur was still out there waiting for me. He brought me to the pier, and it's getting dark now, quite dark. He drives up to the pier, opens the door for me, and just about the same time, the skipper of the ship is getting out of a rickety old taxi, and he sees the chauffeur <laughs> taking me out of the, you know, help me out of the car. And he says, Chief, I don't know who you know or, or what you've been up to. <laughs> He says, uh, this is amazing. <laughs> the chauffeur gave me his boss's card. It was the president of the Bank of Lisbon. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> <clears throat> we corresponded for several Christmases after that. He finally passed away. Mm -hmm. But what a, a wonderful experience in humanity you know, people, uh, you know, just like you and I, 
regardless of where they are in this world, there are generous people, there are people that want to be, uh, you know, friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, I think, is probably the biggest gift of the military is that you meet some wonderful people. They have a common interest, a love for the country. And that, I think, is what uh, sort of lures people into the military is that uh, they have a love for the country. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it. Uh, well, I was up to Home Depot in Shrewsbury not too long ago. I had some bags of lime that I'd wheeled out to the car. I lifted the hood, the uh, trunk, and uh, this fellow, half my age, come running over and he said, "Let me load them for you." I said, you had to be in the military. He says, yes, I was. And I found that so many instances of uh, the military people, uh, they, they have a love for their fellow man, mm -hmm. much more so than a lot of people that never experienced that. Mm -hmm. And every chance I get, I try to uh, talk with young people about, you know, maybe college isn't what you should be jumping to right away after 12 years of uh, schooling. Take a break. Get out and see the world and mm -hmm. uh, go into the military because it teaches you the things that you never learn mm -hmm. in the public school system. How to get along with people. Mm -hmm. How people in other parts of the country feel about things. Uh, you know, maybe experience uh, different types of jobs and opportunities you might have never thought of going off to college. Mm. So it give you some real reason to go to college. Right. Uh, let's get, let's wheel back a little bit. After the Navy, uh, what kind of work did you do? Well, I stayed in electronics. Uh, I went to work for uh, a school out in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Cleveland Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up as their industrial manager here on the East Coast, going into uh, companies like Eastman Kodak, mm -hmm. uh, and radio stations and so forth, up and down. I had, my territory was everything east of the Mississippi. And uh, I probably did more traveling after I got out of the service than uh, while I was in. And uh, helping to develop uh, training programs for field service people which I enjoyed because I, I got to work with a lot of uh, training directors mm -hmm. of major corporations. Boy, oh my, your wife must have been a very tolerant woman for you to have having to travel for <coughs> during the service and then after. Well, one thing about a military wife, she has to be the mother, the father, the disciplinarian, the nurse, everything, mm -hmm. and yes, She's a strong woman, mm. and uh, the divorce rate, I guess, in the military is very, very high mm -hmm. because a lot of women don't uh, uh, can't handle the extra burden of the responsibility. But uh, you know, it's worked out well for us. Uh, while I was teaching in Boston. I was able to uh, build our house. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, when I left uh, First Naval District, uh, my wife really had no desire to, to travel. As a matter of fact, most of the places I went, she couldn't mm -hmm. be with me anyway. 
so it, it worked out well. Mm. Would you like to say your wife's name? <laughs> Dorothy. All right. <laughs> now, did your children uh, enter the military? My oldest boy, Jeffrey, mm -hmm. uh, followed me by going into the submarine service. Mm -hmm. The grandson, Nicholas, uh, just got back a short time ago from serving a tour in uh, Afghanistan as an ordnance demolition technician. Um, Army? Marines? Army. Army, okay. Yeah. And uh, he, before he went over to Afghanistan, he was certain he was a 20-year man. He loved the Army. But uh, he got one year of schooling in demolition, and that was interesting. They, uh, <coughs> they had the school at the uh, Air Force Base in Florida, taught by Navy, school, school, Navy SEALs, and he was in the U.S. Army. So there's cooperation of... <laughs> uh, <laughs> services. But when he got over there, the things he had to do and the things he saw, that uh, by the time he finished his tour, he decided he would take a break from it. Mm -hmm. He's still in the uh, National Guard and quite active in it, hmm. but uh, taking a break from uh, going on tour again. Mm -hmm. George, is there anything you'd like to say before we wrap up this interview? Uh, no, I, I, I appreciate what you folks are doing. I, I was out there just a few minutes ago looking at uh, the large array mm -hmm. of uh, the interviews you've done. I recognize the names on some of the interviews mm -hmm. you've done. I think it's a I did this over in Holliston, very, very crude interviews on 26 veterans about 10 years ago. And sadly, as chaplain for the VFW, I've had to bury nine of them. So I'm glad that we had the mm -hmm. uh, interviews. Mm. They're presently at the library over in Holliston. Mm -hmm. well, any any effort to preserve is always good, and also um, you are also a regular <coughs> participant in one of the programs that's co-sponsored by the Veterans Oral History Project, and that's the annual Veterans Breakfast at Kennedy Middle School. I've attended all ten years. Uh. I've Dave Jocelyn mm -hmm. uh, invited me to uh, the first one, and uh, I'm very impressed mm -hmm. <coughs> the the work that the young people do prior to the breakfast impressed me when uh, the very first time I came over, they had their pads and pencils and questions already on the page mm -hmm. that they were going to ask, and they took it very seriously. Mm. And uh, each year, I'm impressed with uh, what they've been instilled. Uh, and if all schools did that, I think it would help an awful lot to make young people understand what it's all about. Mm -hmm. I, I think we take too much for granted these days. Uh, I had. One of my grandsons came home a while ago and was saying, well, Dad, the Gramps were studying ancient history. I said, oh, the Roman Empire? No, World War II. Ooh. <laughs> and I said, son, <laughs> you don't know. Uh, but uh, no, the, the world has changed considerably. But. Uh, I, I, I'm grateful for what I've seen and uh, 
I still have faith in mankind. <laughs> okay. Well, George Snow, thank you so much for taking part in the Veterans Oral History Project. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this is a poem written by Linda Ellis, and the title is Life's Dash. It's something that I've been giving for a number of years at uh, military funerals. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth, and the second he spoke with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time his friend had spent alive on earth. And now, only those who loved him know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live in love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you'll never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand how other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy's being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash?